to you by Brass and Unity. We make wearable conversation starters. Our new Buddy Check Packs are available now. Grab one and check on one of your closest buddies. They may need it now more than ever. Go to BrassandUnity.com, use the code UNITY, and get 20% off. And let's all heal together. And brought to you by Combat Flip Flops. Bad for running and even worse for fighting. Combat flip-flops are your ticket to the unarmed forces by providing you with military-inspired quality footwear for men and women. To help support the podcast and in support of women in developing countries, head over to combatflipflops.com and become a part of their unarmed forces today. Be sure to use the code UNITY at checkout and get 25% off. And brought to you by GFDA. Good fucking design advice. The voice in your head and the foot up your ass. GFDA makes prints, drinkware, and apparel for people who want to do their fucking best. Go and use the code UNITY and get 10% off now on anything on their site, including our collaborative product, Fucking Help Somebody. And brought to you by Daisy May Hat Co., the custom hat company based in Nashville, Tennessee. They make custom one-of-a-kind hats from wide-brimmed fedoras to cowboy hats. All of their hats are 100% beaver felt, and it's the highest quality hat you can get. They also have the coolest shirts ever. You can use the code BRASS at checkout for 15% off your entire order. Go and check out daisymayhats.com. Embrace the fever. Live the dream. Hey, you. Have you checked in with yourself today? How are you doing? How are you feeling? Have you had enough water? This is your midday check-in, brought to you by Midday Squares. Big breath in. (sighs) I'm back at it. I love when the thing says recording in progress. There's something weird and like kind of sexual about it. It's like, that's intense. Thank you so much I, for that warning. Yeah, I get really like bubbly inside, especially my no-no area. I'm like, Ooh, hello. Ooh, we're recording. <laughs> yeah. What happens? Hello, Cody. Welcome to the show. Howdy. Howdy. I got a lot of questions for you. Some I know that have been covered on a previous episode you just did with Sean Ryan, a friend of ours. And don't get me wrong. Sean's good, but I'm going to ask the different questions. And oh, that's, yeah, get nervous. Be, get sweaty. Do you feel sweaty? Good. Yeah, good. I like it. I like this vibe. I'm here for it. So let's let's just start. <clears throat> You're an American, uh, borderline Canadian based off of where you live. So <laughs> sorry. <laughs> it's fine. Just I like- love it. Just accept it. You're part of communism now. How does it feel? It feels real nice. (laughs) Oh, this is going to be so fun. Okay. First off, I have known about you a little bit through a few friends in our community based off of psychedelics and kind of learning a little bit about you from where you've already gotten to and how you've healed. And like I said, I know you've spoken a bit about your background, but for those that are listening that don't quite understand what you did, what is the difference between a Marine Raider and a Marine? So the difference between a Marine Raider and a Marine is a Marine Raider is our special operations, our command side of it, um, where a Marine is the title, like I'm a soldier, I'm a, in the Navy. Uh, so, and to become a Raider, you have to go through a selection process. You have to uh, go through an entire pipeline. It's about like a year and a half long. And then you make it into the community. And that's kind of like how you start your your next uh, uh, next adventure in life in the military. Okay. So that, I mean, that makes a little more sense because I do have conversations with Marines and Marine Raiders. And Yet somebody still has not answered that question for me accurately enough for me to wrap my brain around it. So does that make I'm, sense? It makes complete sense. It's it's interesting too because you know I've worked with Americans and I've never worked with Marines. I've always worked with the Army there on that side. At least that's I think I did. And they were a very different type of human being. And as I've gotten to know the American culture a little bit more and the ins and outs of what you guys did versus kind of what we did or the British did, um, I'm starting to understand how many different compartmentalization units you have. It's just very different versus us. We have the army, we have the army, and then we have special operations. So when you hear Marine, Marine Raider, it makes a little more sense the way you explain it. So thank you for that. Yeah. So we work with like CANSOF all the time. Like my last rotation to Iraq, we worked, you know, directly with Can- uh, Canadian soft. Uh, so that's, that's basically how that goes. So just like 
Cancel. They support the army, right? They support like the the big forces. Same thing with special operations in the U.S. military. Same thing. Support the general purpose force as well as can do uh, conduct special operations missions. Interesting. Okay, I like it. I'm here for it. So, what years did you join the military? I joined in. <clears throat> I think it was May 2003, and I retired in September 2018. Okay, so you you were in for a good amount of time there. A little bit, yeah. Yeah, just a little bit. Just a little bit. Just I, like I, a tiny bit. It's crazy because I'm like, oh, it's yeah, it's like 15 years, and it's funny is because people will message me like, oh, I only did like two years. I'm like, bro, you did two. That's more than like 99 percent of anybody. And I'm just like, oh, 15 years and. But when it becomes your life, you know, it's, you, you know what I'm saying? Like, oh, I was in high school for a year. You know, like, do we separate it like that? So, I don't know. It's, it's weird. I'm still adjusting to it. It's four years later and I'm still figuring it all out. That's okay. It'll take some time. And I think, I mean, I think for the most part, considering, you know, we'll jump forward a little bit here, considering where you're at now, I mean, you've come a long way. And I think that's important to acknowledge, you know, <clears throat> from the type of position that you're in before to what you do now. It's a very different, it's a very different life and it takes time. And and I think anybody who expects people when they get out of the service after being in that long to just kind of wrap their brain around life and just start functioning normally in society is, I think that's ridiculous and just uneducated conversation. And I think it's gross because it takes time. I did four years. It took me a just over a decade to get my shit back together. So, you know. It happens. Wow, that was very Canadian. Of that me. was super Canadian. Yeah, you know. Eh. I heard. I heard it. I heard it, and that's probably the first time I've ever heard it on my own episode. So that's embarrassing. <laughs> it could be the Canadian you're bringing out in me. Um. Okay. Let's get right into it. You decided to join the military. I heard your background, but for those who don't know, you were kind of a driven individual even before the military, eh? Yeah. I really. Uh, I was super stoked to kind of live out like my childhood dream of going in the military and becoming uh, a scout sniper and really kind of pursuing that avenue of approach. Um, it's just all I wanted to do as a kid. And then getting in the Marine Corps, it was just, that was like, that was just it. It was just like this like constant focus. Like, this is what I want to do. Um, and I didn't really have that wishy-washy effect. You know, I ran into a lot of people and I'm sure you have too. It's like, oh, I wanted to do this, but you know, I, I didn't allow butts or anyone else to, because I was fortunate enough to stand up for myself, but there's a lot of guys that wanted to do the things that I was doing, but they had issues with their command or like a, like a, you know, a subordinate leader or something like that. I'm like, bro, you got to like fight for your stuff. If you want to go to do anything in life, especially in the military, which is, you know, your hands are in your life is really in the, the spouse of someone else. Like you you have to you hope that someone has your best intentions because it's not usually how it is so you have to like make things happen they're not always going to happen for you so yeah i'd say driven for sure yeah i mean by the sounds of it the way you were with vision boards as a child is something very different than most people back then would even um, acknowledge let alone do you know i mean what 15 years ago well, even before that and you come from you come from a military background correct in regards to like my family yeah yeah my dad was in the marines i honestly don't even know how long he never really talked to me about that my dad's, my dad's dead now and you know I, I have some regret like not knowing more about his his backstory his life but uh through his uh extensive like uh genealogy history that he used to he would dive into all the time like it seems like the alfords were basically tracked us all the way back to like the revolutionary war oh wow um yeah, it's super crazy. So, but that never, I was never introduced to that as a kid. That was never an influence. There was never like, oh, be like your grandpa. I didn't, I didn't even know my grandpa on either side. You know, I didn't, I didn't know these things. So I really, I kind of grew up a sheltered life. I, I knew my family. I knew my mom's siblings. I knew some, like my dad's sister. And, but that was it. I never really did the whole big family thing, your cousins and sometimes, but I don't know if I had the mental capacity to understand it because after those moments were over, I'd go back home and I'm the only kid living by myself, trying to entertain myself. And that's why I would build these like fantasies of like what I wanted to do in my life. 
And that was that was of no fault of your parents. I mean, they they were working, right? They weren't. You weren't. You know, they I were these type neglected. of people. Yeah, <laughs> I wasn't just neglected. The TV wasn't my only friend. Oh, that's God. Yeah, that's big, sad. It was a big but, friend, though. <laughs> of, of course, but it yeah. it's you know they were hardworking individuals. So I always try to you know make that known as you weren't you weren't a neglected child, but you definitely were somebody that had a good example of hard work. And that's probably why you're able to be successful in the military. And then out of the military, you had a good example of what that looks like. I did, but, you know, talking to my mom more now, she tells me like, I was always like lazy as a kid. Like I didn't want to work. I wanted to like, I loved the things that I loved and manual labor was not one of them. I loved mm. to play paintball. I love to do physical activities. I just didn't like the the hard work that had to be done that wasn't, you know, had my best interests. I, so I think I, I was very selfish as a kid in, in a lot of regards to that stuff. And then even in the military, I'm like, dude, how the hell did I even survive this thing? Uh, because, you know, I can still find myself being late to everywhere I go. I can still like find myself unorganized and scatterbrained. I'm like, bro, how do I manage this for 15 years and like, just not get like, just smashed in the face, but it had happened. So I'm grateful of it. Well, I mean, <clears throat> I think that also comes down to uh, that conversation. A lot of people, a lot of people do this with their kids where they're like, well, their kid has ADD or has ADHD because they're not interested in sitting in school and sitting and being quiet. But if you give them something they love and that they're passionate about, they will go full on with it. And I think that's a, you know, that's an example of kind of you, you found, you just needed to find the thing that was that for you. And it sounds like being a scout sniper, that's probably why you didn't get smashed by the military is because you found the thing you loved, you were passionate about, and you were able to genuinely put your heart and soul into. Yeah, that's definitely true. Uh, you know, not tooting up my own horn, but you know, I wasn't a very good Marine, like a textbook Marine. I didn't look the part. I didn't really, I wasn't super disciplined. I'd ask questions. I asked why, which therefore you're automatically not a disciplined person. Mm -hmm. uh, you're, you question authority. I did that all the time. And not to just be that person that just is that guy that's always saying stuff. But I, I generally wanted to know because I, I learned from a little young age, like if I don't have a buy-in, if I don't understand why, it's going to be hard for me to like follow through with it and like actually give it my all. If, if my dad told me just go outside and dig a hole, which this was a true story, I'm like, this is stupid. I just bitched about it, you know, but once I realized like, Hey, Oh, we're putting a small little fish pond back here. And it's, you know, the, my mother really wants one. Like now I have more context, which I think a lot of people leave out the why and any type of cat task condition standard. And therefore you have a lot of resistance. And for me, I excelled with like, like leadership roles and like I excelled under pressure and I, ex I basically excelled anytime I was absolutely scared shitless. Um, because I know when I was sitting in the back, if I miss an opportunity to like raise my hand, I'd feel, I feel like I cheated myself, but I also felt uncomfortable because I'm like, this guy doesn't clearly want to be here as bad as I do, you know? And mm. I didn't want it to like, I didn't want to be a, a subordinate to people who didn't value the things that I value the most, like how to treat people or like the job or like they sucked at patrolling, you know, whatever thing that I was into back in the day, like, I'm so glad that I was in the positions that I was in because I got to learn so much as a young Marine of like the good and the bad of what I liked from people, what I didn't like from people. And I was so eager to implement those. And once I had my opportunity, I started using my voice and that didn't go over well with a lot of people, but I was always making waves and like, I was always bringing people with me too. And I think that's, that's what really helped me out a lot was that like team spirit, that team at set the team mindset the whole thing about the military i really love that aspect of it because if you have an opportunity you can make it what you wanted to make it if you have an opportunity and you choose not to make it what you make it you usually find it to complain and bitch about it and how you got cheated and you know you become a victim in that story did 9 11 have anything to do with you wanting to join or was this already set in your mind before yeah, it was already set in my mind way before. 9-11 uh, was, you know, back in the day, I mean, I'm not as, I wasn't as educated as I am now with like my own belief systems and stuff like that. But 9-11 back in the day was like, that was it. I mean, there was, they wouldn't even, they didn't even say like the word bitch on TV back in the day. You know, they didn't say ass. I you know? know. And now you see this grotesque violence, you know, and all this like carnage and death happening 
on TV. And that was like the most probably profound thing that ever happened on the screen, at least in my comprehension and like understanding. And you just, I just knew that the path that I was going to go on was inevitably going to lead me into harm's way, but that was not the catalyst to want to propel me. It didn't, it didn't give me this new sense of like pride of like red, white, and blue to go fight for my country. Um, I just, was like okay well this is it i'm gonna i'm gonna have to deal with this when i come into the military so i just kind of took it into consideration but it was it was definitely a shock you know being a little kid you see something like this and you're like damn my job of being a scout sniper well shit i'm actually gonna have to go do this job now and get a chance to go do that job because we're going to war you know you hear these crazy right. things like war you're like what <laughs> insane like it's stupid but well how was well, not stupid not at all how, how old <laughs> was how old were you when 9-11 happened man i don't know how old I'm are you now i'm 37 so okay yeah. <laughs> i guess okay. i could have just done math like that right no 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 no. no. the reason i ask is because i was a little bit younger so you guys aren't we're not far off but i i'm trying to understand <clears throat> what kind of age you were when you saw that for the first time, because, you know, for some people, depending on who you talk to, they were either so young, they don't remember it, or they were at the point where they were malleable enough to have seen it, recognized how aggressive it was to have watched it on the TV. Because I know that's how I watched it. I watched it on the TV before going to school that morning. I saw it happen with the, we were, yeah, we were the same time zone where I lived at the time, but I remember watching it very vividly. And I, I was, uh, I think 11, but I remember it going, Oh, something is wrong here. Something was really wrong. And like, when you say, you know, they didn't even say ass or bitch on TV. And then you see people falling out of the sky and you're realizing for me, that was only a few hours away. That that was a few hour drive from where I was currently living. And to, you know, respond to it the way you did and not just see, okay, I'm going to go serve because of that. You had that in your mind before. A lot of people I talked to, it seemed like 9-11 for them was like the moment where it like pushed it, it pushed the line for them, whether they had military family before or whether they just saw that and felt this kind of like whatever just happened, I don't want to let have happen again. And whether it's, they knew how to prevent that themselves, they just knew, okay, well, if we're going to go to war, that means you have to join the military. So off we go. I'm going to go do whatever, whatever that means. Yeah. See, I don't know when I, when I literally stop and I look back on my life, you know, did I want to like go fuck shit up? in boot camp when they're like showing you all the propaganda videos of like you know oif1 yeah i wanted to go fuck shit up you know they're playing god smack and like you know hate breed and like all these like like crazy stuff with these like explosions and tanks and you're like super hyped because you're like in boot camp getting like you know brainwashed they, to like they show that to you guys yeah they uh during like i don't know what phase they call it but there's a lot there's a good portion of boot camp where you're getting like education like you're mm -hmm. in a classroom environment yeah and uh they're like before the drill instructors or the teachers would teach something they'd like play that like a, they call it moto video and it was just like because oif1 was happening already um you know so there was already like war and rockets and tanks and shooting and things blowing up so they'd play these moto things because you know let's be real all those military classes those boot camp classes especially the one i was in we were all going to go to war like it's just inevitable and this is only two years after you know oif1 kicked off and so you know did we people know back then it was going to be a 20 plus year war no but people knew that it wasn't going to go away anytime soon so i think they were just kind of like hey you guys and girls are here now like let's get our minds right because this is what you're facing you know i don't think it was just like super super programming but i do think it was definitely uh trying to hype it up because you're a marine right like you're supposed to go like smash things and i think that's just kind of like the culture of it all i don't think it's wrong or right i just think it was it is what it was that's just a shock to my system sometimes when i hear that because we just never had any of that we i mean we weren't involved in iraq we were involved in afghanistan and that, I mean, <clears throat> let me try that again. 
we were involved in conventional forces in Afghanistan and not conventional forces in Iraq, because <laughs> we all know that what that means. Yeah. Um, but for us, I mean, basic training, things like that, you're sitting in those classrooms. That's not at all. We never had any of those conversations. That was, we all knew we were going to go, but there was never any of these moto videos. There was never any of this kind of conversation. I think the first time that we were ever kind of brought up and said, Hey, you're going to go deploy. Um, once we knew about that, the conversation was never brought, like, you're going to go smash heads and you're going to go, it was very hearts and minds. They were saying hearts and minds to, you know, triple seven gunners and <laughs> the boys who knock. I mean, that doesn't make any damn sense. And so we never received any of that. And it still blows my mind when I talk to Americans because the culture around your military is so different. It is so extreme and it's so heavy and it's so encapsulating. And when people say, oh, I joined because of this video or I joined because of that video, it's like... I've just never been around this before. So I can imagine when you start getting brainwashed, however you want to call that, because some people are watching this, I'm, you know, being sarcastic, but there is an aspect of that that is real. There is, let me ask you this. Do you think that that was helpful to you seeing those types of videos? Or do you think that that brought in um, a disproportionate level of aggression towards uh, the people in that country? I, man, I got goosebumps just hearing you say that, you know, I look at war completely different as a disclaimer, you know, and when it comes mm -hmm. to brainwashing and programming, I believe in all the subliminal stuff, uh, it's all done for a reason. Um, and when it comes to those videos, I don't think the, 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 uh, the teachers at the time thought any deeper than what they were actually just showing people, mm -hmm. but I definitely, you know, I hated everything about Iraq. Really? And I knew nothing about Iraq, you know, mm -hmm. all I knew is like, I'm going to go over there and like, do, you know, I'm not just a do what I'm told, but like, we're going to go over there. We're going to go to war, you know, like it was not a lot of education going on. And uh, I think it was come, kind of asked backwards, but once again, how do you get a bunch of 18 year old kids when there hasn't been a war going on for fuck since the world war two or sorry, Vietnam, how do you get all this generation of people to like sell their soul to like get into like war mode so when they go over there they're instant obedience to orders they're fucking pulling the trigger not being conscious objectors and they're doing the fucking bidding you know how do you do that when you do that through repetition and implementation of like you know strategic things you know that's why blue camps a certain way that's why order and discipline's a certain way that's why drills a certain way that's why these videos are a certain way and uh you know because it's fucked up because there's I've met some of the nicest people in Iraq. I've met some of the nicest people in some of the in all the countries I've actually been to, and it's it's is very sad that the perception is very linear. But what do you expect? You know, information wasn't a main thing back in the day. Educating yourself wasn't a main thing back in the day. Being aware was emotionally controlled is my uh, good example of what America is like. I love my country uh, for what it stands for. Uh, the potential of what it stands for, not necessarily what it is. And, um, you know, it is a very emotionally controlled, just look at the next big flashy thing that happens, you know, Americans are on their phone. Oh, I stand with this country. I stand with this. I'm like, bitch, you don't even stand with your own country. You don't <laughs> right. even you trash on your street. You don't even say hi to a bum, let alone look at that person in the face. Like they have a soul, Yeah. you know, but they're so emotionally controlled because we're always like, just, told to look outwards and do all these things and watch the news and it's just you know looking back at you know at 37 looking back when i was 18 years old i'm like damn it is it's sad but it's comical at best you know but that's but this is my perspective and my perception of it all too and that's through a lot of self-reflection a lot of work uh i regret nothing um i'm not mad about anything a lot of these things you have to go through and experience so you can rise through them and have a different outlook and perspective on life. And I never would have had, I don't think the perspective and outlook on life that I have today, if I did it, if I wasn't an 18 year old kid inside boot camp watching these moto videos and, and experiencing all the things that I did, because I got to formulate my own opinion early on that I wasn't going to just do what people told me to do. And I wasn't going to have this mindset of like killer, killer, killer. Like there's, there's a different way to live and 
I can honestly say I don't feel I was ever emotionally controlled at a young age. Um, and I never bought into the, the, you have to be this way. Why aren't you motivated like me? Like I never, I made my own decisions and I was literally just trying to fucking do the things that I wanted to do without letting everything else try to influence me on how I should feel. Hmm. Um, <clears throat> you said something there that I want to touch on. You said, sell your soul. Do you, do you believe that when you joined or when people are joining during the GWA era, that that's what that was? We were selling our souls. I think whenever you go into something, thinking the intention is one thing, but the outcome or the perception of it is another thing, I think you sell a part of your soul. I think you... You know, it's like going into a relationship. You're like, oh man, this is going to be a great relationship. And you find out that it's just actually really bad. It's not what you thought it was going to be. A lot of deception, a lot of lies, a lot of pain, and it hurts you inside. And part of you, you feel if you're, you know, if you're not like strong enough to take your power back, part of you feels like you've been cheated. Uh, part of you is gone and missing. You're hurt. You're broken inside. And, you know, I, I think uh, there is a heavy price to pay to actually go to war. I think there's even a heavy price to pay to uh, willingly know and sacrifice your consciousness, your, 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 your power of voice to say, I'm going to do this because of that. You know, you're willingly giving up your right uh, for a lot of things at that point. And the deeper you go down that rabbit hole, in my personal opinion, you know, you could go all the way where you just become this like, bro, you're like a machine now. And you, 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 you're like, you're the super fan of war. You know, you're going to buy all the merch. You're going to do all the things. You're going to go to all the shows. You're going to go on all the fucking missions. You're going to fucking, you know, keep on sacrificing yourself. And then you're going to come back completely soulless because you are fighting for something not necessarily bigger than yourself. You're fighting for something, not even including yourself in it. And I think if you do that long enough in anything, war or not, I think a part of you is going to go away. Obviously, I don't believe that you had that feeling when you went in. Uh, like you said, you're something that you said there, it's like a bad relationship. Uh, I can't help but I know you believe in what you did, but I can't help but go back to some of the words that you're saying because they sound like, you know, you learned something from them, but you didn't realize how bad it would be. Is that because we couldn't fully wrap our brains around what we were really doing there until we were doing it? Or was the mission set different than you were told it would be? Uh, I just, I don't think anyone knows what to expect when it comes to war until you're put between a rock and a hard place. And I think you can train for war. You can have all the schooling about the war doctrine and, you know, all this other shit. But in, in t when you get punched in the face, that's when you find out and i just i was an 18 year old kid i didn't know any different i was i was motivated i joined because i wanted to join you know but i was motivated to go do my job i was stoked to not be behind a desk i was stoked to be able to go on a deployment you know in fact on my very first deployment i had a chance to go to sniper school before i deployed uh because my platoon my battalion was actually looking for volunteers to go to another battalion and they're like, hey, if you if you go to, if you go to this other battalion, we'll give you a seat to go to sniper school in like a month. And oh, my wow. friends and I, the new guys in the platoon, we looked around. We're like, fuck that, dude. <laughs> like this is going to be epic, and like we all know it. And by epic, I meant monumental, uh, because truly, my first rotation and the subsequent ones after that, nothing has ever touched those things. Um, and you know, no matter how eager I was for any of them, you know, I just would not have any thought process that I do today if I didn't go experience that. And like I said, I partook, I partook in all of it. You know, I, I, I lost a lot of my soul. I lost a lot of my, my, um, who I was and all these things because I wasn't strong enough before 18 to know how to fight for those and, and invest in them daily to protect myself and to, uh, you know, constantly fight for that, that that power to be me and stay whole and you know if i have to go into hell that's fine but let me go in with fucking like 
let me go suited up now, more prepared mentally, physically, and emotionally, where at 18 years old, I didn't know how to do any of those things. Well, I mean, that's understandable. So you were a sniper, a scout sniper <clears throat> when you actually deployed? I was in a sniper platoon. Uh, I was on a sniper team. I didn't go to school yet at the time. I went to school actually right when I got back from that deployment. Okay. So you're, you're going and doing a job where, yes, you were 18, but do you think that if you did have the wherewithal or you did have the education you have now, do you truly believe that you could have pulled the trigger the same way you did back then when you didn't know any better? I don't, I never shot out of fucking, uh, I've never shot out of uneducation, like uneducated. I never did anything because I was told to, and I never did anything because I'm like, oh, this would be cool. Um, you know, I, I feel like everything I ever did or put myself into or was experienced, it was all just in regards to it was a fucking fight. Uh, it was someone trying to kill me and us trying to kill them. I, I, I'm very grateful that I never had an experience where it wasn't that scenario. So even if it was fucking today, I'm not stoked on it. I love life, dude. I, I don't want to take life. I don't, I don't want to be, I can't even watch war movies now, not because it gives me PTSD, but I just don't like that vibration shit. You know, it doesn't suit me anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, so it would be different now, but if you come at me today, I'm obviously going to defend myself like that, that part's in all of us. Uh, right. But I think at 18, you know, if I had more education about like the preservation of my soul and all these things, would I still be able to do the job? Absolutely. Because one thing I learned is that there was no home when I was deployed. There was no mm. fucking Taco Bell. There was no nothing. You're there because I've allowed my mind to slip before on deployments. And it is a very scary slope because you are there whether you like it or not. Like you're there for six, eight months, whatever your rotation is. And if your head's not in the game, it's like a drunk driver. The drunk driver never gets fucking killed. Yeah, everyone else gets killed. Everyone else you. gets killed. And so there's a lot of responsibility. And that was instilled on us at a very young age too. And I had a bunch of amazing men that I worked with that weren't like, let's just kill everything. They were just super, they were dudes that were like, bro, like we're here, let's, we're gonna do a fucking job. We're going to be smart about it. You know, we're going to take care of each other. We're going to do the right fucking thing that you can in war. And we're going to fucking mm -hmm. push forward. And, you know, I had, there was a very high caliber of men that was in the military still back in the 2002, 2003 era, 2004 era. Uh, those guys were all gone after like 2004 and a half, 2005. And it was a different generation, that different breed of generation that I saw uh, from like 2001 OAF one veterans to these 2000 you know oh i have two and three and all these other numbers they make up and shit it was completely different it was way more gung-ho it was way more i mean fuck phones are out now internet's out now so like it was like it was like war porn and mm -hmm. people wanted to fucking masturbate to that shit you know people wanted to be involved in that stuff and it was a completely different generation that's that's the main reason why i had to get out of the infantry uh like the infantry a battalion i couldn't stay there anymore because the whole mindset was completely shaping you know it went from like a professional like fucking warrior where it's like yo if we have to deal it we'll deal it um to like let's just fucking you know let's just go let's let's just live a moto video 24 7 and it, it just was it's, it's super toxic well it's it's not only toxic but it's risky and it i think at the time <clears throat> that generation didn't realize the significance that would play down the road because we hadn't, I mean, we should have known better. We should know better. If you go back and you look at a World War II vet, um, a Vietnam vet, a Korea vet, and you look at them and you sit there and, and I'm, this isn't all of them, but I'm saying you sit there and you look at people and you go, why don't they talk? Why do they drink so much? Why are they all divorced? Why are they da, 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 and you look at that and you go, okay, well, these guys didn't have videos and cameras, but they were living that life. They were living that life in a real way. And so I think there was a period of time where we forgot what that meant to actually go and run and gun the way that was going to be needed. And the war porn is real. I I can tell you the war porn is real. It is, it is something that people want to not only be a part of, <clears throat> 
but here's the other thing I found um, later on in life, like uh, last year, this year kind of deal. If you don't have video of what you did, then no one believes what you did. If you don't have proof, then no one believes what you did. And it's not that you should always want to have it. But the point is, is like if there was a, it was advantageous to record shit then. It really was. I mean, when I deployed, I didn't have the GoPros weren't a thing yet. I miss GoPros by like a year or two. So when I go back and I look at my stuff, I've got like one album total of like everything I've ever done in the service. But I talked to some dudes that are like you who were in for 15 years, who did the expansion of not only Iraq, but Afghanistan, all these in between. And they have drives full, just drives full of like GoPro footage and all of these things. And what I don't think people realize is what that does to you later on in life or has the potential to do to you later on in life. Yeah, that I, I have my shit that I have is because people on my team took pictures or like people I was with. I honestly felt weird to take pictures of that shit. I never, you know, there was those guys that like gathered sand and shit. You're like, okay, safe and private Ryan, you know, like <laughs> you're like reliving a fucking movie. You know what I'm saying? Like, I felt like a lot of people yeah. reliving a movie. And then I, I met some older guys are like, dude, take pictures of this shit, man, because you're you're not going to be doing this job forever and you're going to want to fucking like remember stuff. And I agree. There's a lot of great things in the military, you know, to like take pictures of, but I had some homies that I'm like, bro, like you need to delete that bitch and like burn that shit, dude. Like, yeah, that's like a war you, crime, son. You don't need copies of that. You definitely don't need any association with that stuff. And, but a lot of guys got off on that shit, like truly, cause it is war porn. And you know, th these are the people that I didn't want to be around. You know, because that's a linear mindset, bro. Mm -hmm. Like, because those same guys that were like war junkies, they sucked back at home. When it comes time to train or lead people, they were fucking horrible. Mm -hmm. And they were only like praised for all their like glorified war shit because of their, their glorified war shit. But when it came home to them, because let's just say out of, you know, you know, us, when we do a rotation, it's a two-year cycle. We have about a year and a half workup and then a six-month deployment. And then we repeat that process. Dude, so, but for a year and a half, you're back in America or like another somewhere else doing training and you're doing a workup and you're around people and people are only good for six months, but they suck ass for a year and a half. And it showed a lot, at least in, in the world that I lived in. I'm like, dude, you're like a one-trick pony, bro. Like, I'm like, why do people like, praise you so much like you mm -hmm. suck now because those people aren't in meetings that i'm in as a leader with these other leaders i'm like dude i just see your true colors and you're not all this bag of potato chips that people are fucking claiming about and but that's that's what it was man people hold on to these accolades they hold on to like oh did you see this i'm like yeah we all saw that bro but did you see the fucking dudes that need your guidance that you're like fucking over you know but it, it's a lot of it's just a lot of weirdness, but it's not just the military. I think that's anywhere where there's a hierarchy. Mm -hmm. Anything that has a hierarchy has that level of like fuckery that exists. This yeah, is just no. fuckery with guns. <laughs> yeah, this is fuckery with a different level of firepower. That's all. Yeah. That's that's for sure. So what <clears throat> can we talk a little bit about your first deployment? Um just to kind of give people a little bit of context into what it was like going into Iraq for the first time during one of the most iconic and well-known, um, I guess, operations. I think there is still to this day. Yeah, it was, uh, it might give me goosebumps too. Um, <laughs> Sorry, I have a way of saying things sometimes that just breaks like, people's brains. <laughs> <laughs> Giving you all the feels, son. Uh, yo, I got, I've definitely got the ch chicken feels, the chicken feels right now. Um, mm. Yeah, that deployment was, you know, it was, I was super excited. It was a new opportunity, new experience. And, you know, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll say this, like, who doesn't want a chance to go? You've been training for football the whole off season. Who doesn't want to get a chance to go on the, on the, on the, on the field and play, you know, and I'm getting this opportunity and I'm not like, I'm going to kill people. I'm just like, fuck, I'm going to get to deploy. Like, that's like mm -hmm. saying we're going to the park tomorrow. I've never been. What's it yeah. like? It would gave it was that same feeling. Uh, yeah. so it wasn't the war aspect. It was just a completely new experience. This is like my second plane to be on. 
you know, in my life. And my pl first plane was the boot camp, second plane to Iraq, you know, and it That's was just nuts. this whole overwhelming feeling. And, and yeah, dude, it was kind of crazy. And then you get there and you're like, wait a second, this is completely different than my first world problems. And it's completely different. It's a new experience. And you're getting adjusted to that. And then you're getting adjusted to the smell because every place I've been to in, in the world smells differently than the hometown that you're in. You know, everything is different about it. And then, you know, we get we get started with the whole like conflict aspect. And that was completely different. I don't think anyone really knew what we were doing or people knew what we were doing. I don't think people knew what we were getting into. I think a lot of the senior guys were really reflecting off their experience with OIF-1 and OIF-1, I was not there for, but the invasion of Iraq, they did a lot of um, mop suits and gas masks and vehicle right. convoys. And it was very vehicle driven and like fighting holes, like very kind of open terrain. I don't think there was a lot of uh, close quarters battle happening. And I'm, I'm sure there was in certain areas, but probably not the big picture. Uh, a lot of oil field stuff. And this is all CQB. Everything is close quarters battle. It's an all urban environment. Uh, vehicles are death traps. You know, your, your, your vehicles are for the outside of the city. It's in the, you know, on the foot patrols inside the city. And, and to do all those things was absolutely insane. And you talked about like hearts and minds. And that's exactly what my battalion was training for. Uh, we were doing like basically training for martial law. And we get out there and it wasn't hearts and minds at all. There was no martial law. Actually, right when we got there, they started dropping these pamphlets from uh, C-130 saying like, hey, leave the city. If anyone ever remain behind, will be treated as a combatant. You know, like here's this curfew. Anyone out past these hours will be considered a combatant. Because there's people that have been living there from like the dawn of time. They're like, bro, I'm not leaving. You know, the right. old just women, just old people. And they're like, fucking, I ain't, fuck you guys. Like, mm -hmm. I'm going to be here when you guys are gone, you know, like I've seen you before just in another form, you know, of like another form of country coming here for what valuable resource. I'm sorry. What was the math destruction? How dare I say that? <laughs> oh yeah. How dare you say, okay. how dare you not say weapons of mass destruction that we have now know is complete fucking bullshit. And we really just went in for resources. How dare you say the truth? Yeah. It's, and it's crazy too. I mean, I mean, that's a whole like another episode I imagine, but you know, but the, the the first my first deployment to Fallujah, Iraq was absolutely insane. It was so gruesome. It was so violent. It was I it was like going into a haunted house, but you're being shoved into it that you don't and I don't like haunted houses. I still don't. Um makes sense. But it's like being shoved into a haunted house, except for like the chainsaw people actually have chains on their chainsaws and they're like, you know, you're like I don't even know how to get out of here. And so you're basically navigating this new environment completely in the unknown and you're really learning it as you go about it. So that part made it a little bit easier to understand because there wasn't an expected, like, Hey, you should expect this and know this is like, no one knew what to expect. No one knew anything. Um, so I don't, I don't know. I'm just, I just want to answer your question the best that I can, but it was, it was scary. It was unknown. It was dark. It was violent. It was sad. It was, hurtful it was exciting it was um new and it was fucking just absolutely dark all at the same yeah. time i mean some of the most beautiful mo mornings I ever had in my life were on that deployment hearing the hearing the morning prayer happen and the sunrise and absolute fucking calmness and quiet happening and then all hell breaks loose and you're like dude where the fuck am i you know how can i go from this this tranquil tranquil morning to absolute hell in a matter of minutes and um you know that's the whole selling your soul aspect of it because you're not thinking about home or your dog or pizza hut you know your little american first world fucking morsels of happiness you're literally focused on trying to survive and not even do your job it's really just trying to survive and part of your job is to survive um and so it was just it says a lot about the men and women that go out there in the harm's way, especially that deployment. Um, Cause I've never met a better group of people ever in my life. And it's hard to, to say those words and sentences in a wartime environment. But I mean, I was fucking blessed to work with such an amazing group of people. And these are all older senior guys uh, that would end up either being killed that deployment 
going home on that deployment or getting on the Marine Corps after that deployment. And they just did not make that breed this calm, really genuine American, you know, true masculine, true feminine, like just true fucking people. They didn't make them anymore. Social media fucking warped minds, fear porn warped minds, news warped minds, fucking moto videos warped minds. And it all went downhill. I could see it my entire 15 years of my career, how everything transformed. Sorry, I'm just taking note of that because that's, oh, oh, man, it's so true. And it's, it's hard to wrap your brain around if you haven't, when you said, you said something to me that just kind of brought me back and it was that, you know, I've never seen such more, you know, the beautiful mornings, the, those, those moments of peace <clears throat> before the doors start getting kicked in the, the moment where the prayer is being blasted through the city and through the country. And somehow it's being heard from like one end of the country to another. It's insane. I remember sitting in Afghanistan in a field going, how, where are the loudspeakers? What is happening? Because they're so loud and it's, it's, it's five times a day. It's, it's aggressive. And those mornings are beautiful, but you're right. When the chaos hits, you can't be anywhere, but right there, your head cannot be anywhere, but right in what you're in, or you die. Those around you die. And I've spoken to a few people, um, about Fallujah and I get a very mixed, um, response they all end with that was the worst fucking experience of my life. And I think it's because even to this day, civilians and even military members, I don't think we expected or could really wrap our head around what really went down in Fallujah. And I will not make you go any more in depth into that because that is not, uh, that is not anything people should have to relive in my opinion. Um, once is bad enough, <laughs> twice, three times, four times, you know, there's a limit to that. And so we're not going to go there any further, but it seems like Fallujah shaped you. So when you come back from that deployment, what is it like coming back to America and what mindset are you in? I remember uh, the plane landing and I look out the window, there was like maybe like 10 people with like signs and shit like that. And I felt, I felt like just fucking empty. You know, they're like, you know, welcome home. It's just these people that probably lost somebody or, you know, they had loved ones that were coming home too. And they're just taking time out of their day to just show support to these fucking punks, these punks that just got off the fucking bus, you know. Um, and I remember feeling like really lonely and like sad. My, my family wasn't out there and didn't expect them to be out there. Um, but I felt like, I, I'm, you know, I got done in the meat grinder i just got sent back home and it's just silence and i remember that night they put us into these um these buildings same buildings i lived in when i was a boot when i first got into the marine corps uh like super shitty crappy buildings and it was a night that artillery on the other base they shoot fire loom missions and that makes sense yeah let's do that let's fucking do that right when you're sending a plane home yeah yeah, yeah so uh i remember that night like all my homies to include myself we like all fucking like dyke underneath our beds because we were like fuck because like we're just getting pounded 24 7 it seemed like uh and you know you know the deal you shot guns dude when you hear that loud mm. boom and you're just like is this gonna land on my fucking lap is it is it my turn now like you don't it's the scariest fucking like milliseconds that exist don't and you're like oh fuck because it can happen anywhere. And so it took a little bit to get used to that and back in the back in the routine of things. But luckily, luckily, um, my battalion came back home shortly after this, like everyone retrograded back at the same time. And we did our Marine Corps ball. So there was a lot of closure that got to happen. A lot of our friends that were killed, their families were to the ball. Uh, at this time, a lot of our guys who were like amputees, they were able to come to the ball because they were already sent back early months in advance. So like it was a really good closure and like kind of like get together we had because I mean, it was fucking wild, you know, uh, and we were like had this like rock star kind of like status. And as weird as that sounds, a lot of people knew what we did, uh, especially like my unit and uh, 
I remember like going to sniper school, you know, weeks later after coming back from that deployment. Um, and everyone knew, all the instructors knew, heard of my platoon because half those instructors came from my platoon before Fallujah happened. So now we were the young kids. We were the ones with the most experience, the most real world firsthand experience of these tactic techniques and procedures and what's it like. And, um, and so there was a lot of responsibility on that, but there was also a lot of like, get back in your fucking place, which is good because I definitely allowed my ego to get carried away, especially when it came to like correcting me. I'm like, fuck you, dude. Like, yeah. um, but I think that comes with the job, dude, when you're young and you hit rock star status and war doesn't make you a rock star, but surviving the things you did and doing the things you did, uh, that can definitely uh, inflate your ego a little bit. And it could definitely create these like uh, war stories of you, these like Rambo shit. And, you know, to be an 18, 19 year old kid and have that level of, I don't know, eyes on you, visibility, it's fucking kind of unreal. It's because you're like, because I did that. Because <laughs> we were part of the, that's what it takes. Well, fuck. Uh, and so that level of street cred didn't get me anywhere special. Uh, but what it did do was put a lot of fucking things in perspective. Everything that I'm assuming more, I'm like, okay, this is it, dude. You know, A, I only do, I want to be around the best. B, I can only do my best. I can't fuck up. You know, I already see what happens when you fuck up. And then my heroes that I had when I was a young guy, turns out a lot of them weren't heroes overseas. Uh, and so, you know, I'm just kind of like rebuilding how I'm going to play out my my military career. And so coming back from that deployment, uh, it was it was challenging, but I didn't really, once I got that initial, like I'm back at home for like a month, I kind of just like went back to my normal, whatever that was. Uh, I really, I didn't experience the effects of Fallujah probably for like another like three years. Um, oh, wow. Where, yeah, where like, and then I didn't, I didn't experience the effects of, because my first deployment, I got shot in the helmet. Uh, I didn't experience TBI, traumatic brain injury. I didn't experience those effects until probably like another seven years later. Uh, so, because you're just on the go. I went from that deployment to sniper school to you know another like very short workup that i'm deploying to another very major operation called operation still curtain and that was like basically like this like non-stop clearing operation from all these cities and it was fucking gruesome and very violent again it wasn't luja but it was fucking intense you know it was another one of those like they made a damn book out of it type of type of deployments um and so i just kind of like campaign hopped all these different um these deployments and these experiences and it just kind of, it just worked out that way I, didn't, I wasn't seeking it uh but i was fortunate enough to be around and i always say fortunate when i came to all these deployments because the, the men that i met there and got to know on all these deployments i've ever been on in my life uh whether in my unit or someone i supported or ran into an deployment and those fucking people have stories and those people have fucking names and they have faces and they have feelings and emotions and you know being 37 now and you know, I've, uh, I'm still working on making a name for myself to put, you know, make my fucking dent into the world, into the universe. Uh, I get a lot of feedback from people and like, oh man, I didn't do what you did. I'm like, bro, you did enough, man. Why are you, why are you comparing to me? And, you know, um, but I'm very fortunate because I know my, my voice has depth and fucking echo because of the background that I have. And I'm even more grateful that I'm not pushing warmongering and pushing war porn and and telling you this is the way you know like i'm very grateful and i don't think i'd have i'm i have everything to have today because everything that i've gone through in life i was supposed to go through it to be where i'm at today so I don't, i'm not i'm not regretful of any fucking thing uh all my goods my bads the war the sadness the evil the dark shit like all that shit had to happen to evolve and for whatever reason, I was able to fucking evolve and, and realize, okay, I have to evolve every day. I have to work on myself every day uh, because I refuse to survive such hell and see such good men and women fucking never come home. I refuse to fucking let all that go to waste by keeping my mouth shut and fucking drowning myself in booze or smoking myself or, you know, continuing being a victim. And just so we're clear, I was a victim for a very long time. Uh, but that was called war, you know, the war of my mind. Yeah. I, uh, <clears throat> I don't, uh, I think a lot of us are 
I think it's okay to say that a lot of us were victims of the war for a moment. I think that's acceptable. I think nobody leaves war without scars. And if you did, then maybe you stayed at CAF. And that's cool too. You did your part and we're grateful for that part. But there's different types of people. There's different types of deployments. And there's just the result is is drastically different. I know individuals who you never did you go to Afghanistan ever or just Iraq? Uh, Afghanistan also. Oh, did you? OK. Yeah. So, yeah, I didn't know about the ins and outs of that. Was CAF around when you were there? Uh, for Afghanistan, yeah. Yeah. OK. So, you know what I'm talking about when I say CAF, where there's a Tim Hortons and a Pizza Hut and the boardwalk and all of that stuff. So there's people that that's what they see and that's OK and that is fine. But you can't expect those people to have the same story as someone like you or I. It's just not comparable. And that's OK. But it gives and leaves a different type of person when they come home. And you can choose to be a victim your whole life or you can choose to do what you did. And that is when things started to change for you. At what point did you start to realize, okay, this isn't okay and I need to start either working on myself, looking at this, talking about this or seeing someone about this? Uh, I started probably like 2006. I just got to our, at the time, MARSOC, our special operations didn't exist. So our top tier was, it was called force reconnaissance. I just got to force reconnaissance and I was having a lot of flashback type of shit, a lot of weird, like haunting of like my dead friends and like just weird shit, like join me, like weird. My mind was playing weird things on me and I was like, this is fucking nuts. And I was like, this can't happen. Um, and so I ended up. I, you know, I thought about the suicide shit back in the day. I thought about those things. Dude, my 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 marriage at the time was absolute shit. I felt like I fucking destroyed and ruined everything. I felt like there was never going to be any redemption in my life. I felt like I was fucking damaged goods. Like I felt like, you know, when like you break a glass or like picture your kid and you break a glass, you're like, fuck, my mom's going to kill me. You know, mm -hmm. I felt like I couldn't, no matter what I did, I was never going to be able to glue that plate back together. Uh, but what I'm so glad I didn't kill myself because one thing you realize is after you break something and brought to you by midday squares. Have you ever tried a midday square? They are the first functional chocolate bar and they're making waves. They're vegan, gluten-free, dairy-free, soy-free, and non-GMO. They have six grams of protein, four grams of fiber and omega threes. Most importantly, they kill hunger, fuel your brain, boost your mood and all from natural energy. They're everything a chocolate bar isn't and everything a protein bar wishes it was. Use the code KELSEY15 at checkout to get 15% off today. You might not be able to fix that broken thing, but you as the person who broke it or participated in it or was around it, you can still move forward no matter what happened to that item, you know, that it's hurt, broke, or lost at the time. Um, and so, but at this moment, I went to our mental health hospital uh, and I felt super uncomfortable. I went there voluntarily. Uh, Cause I'm like, Hey dude, I'm having these like nightmares and shit. And like, I'm like really fucking all over the place. And it was like instant medication, you know, instant. I think, I don't even remember the fucking name, but you know, some antidepressant shit. And I got in trouble on my team because I was like super lethargic and like very like zombie ish. And my mm -hmm. team leader was like, bro. And I'm new. I'm like fresh meat to this new unit. And my, my team leader is like, bro, you keep on fucking up, dude. You're out of here, dude. And I was fucking up because I was like, my head wasn't in the game. I was still dealing with a fucked up marriage. I was still in my own head. I was still trying to process all this shit. And then they started talking about like, oh, you're not gonna be able to go to free fall school or dive school. Cause you're on this medication and that might fuck you on your clearance and all this all this fucking fear porn. I'm like, Oh my God, fuck this dude. Like I, I shit can these pills. I'm like, these are not working for me. And I just got back into what I did best is getting into the game, getting into the mix and being focused on that. And, you know, at the time I was really just kind of like soothing myself and avoiding all the hard things I needed to do. But at the time I didn't know what heart, I didn't know what self-investment was back in the day. Self-reflection, those words, those weren't even in sentences used back then, you know? And so I did what I could do. And, but my main mission was, Hey, I work mass off to get here. I need to perform. So I need to need to cut off, trim the fucking fat and get back into the game. And that's what I did. And 
uh, you know, that, that would, that bit me in the ass later on in life because I kept on, had another opportunity to really get my head checked out. My sleep was fucked up. My testosterone, my energy was fucked up. Um, and that's, that's that TBI what, stuff there, homie, with that uh, testosterone. Yeah. So I remember I was, this is year later, I'm in Marslock now, and I was teaching, I was a, a our Marslock advanced sniper course, and I also taught surveillance and reconnaissance. And so I remember setting up uh, a, a van hide site, so like a, you know, hiding space inside this vehicle. And I'm like taping some fucking like cloth to the ceiling, and I just like kind of crash down to the fetal position. And my friend's like, dude, what are you doing? I'm like, bro, I got to take a fucking nap like now. And he's like, what? I'm like, oh, I'm fucking out. Um, so I end up going to the doctor. I'm like, yo, dude, I was working on this truck, setting up some cameras and shit. And then I just like passed out. Like, I'm super tired. I like needed to take a nap right then and there. And he's like, um, okay, well, let's get your blood test. And so I got my blood test. And he's like, dude, you have like 70 fucking testosterone. I had lower than a female and um, that explained my erectile dysfunction, that explained my fucking sex drive, that explained my cognitive function and performance, that, that, that explained all sorts of things. I'm like, sick. So I was like one of the first guys back in the day in my unit to get testosterone. Because I asked for <laughs> it. You know? I fucking asked for it. Yeah. Because I went to the doctor. I'm like, hey, dude, uh, my man thing doesn't really work. I'm super tired all the time. And I... I can't focus on shit. I don't know anything. And I'm really lethargic. And so that led to like low testosterone and all these types of things. And then I had this opportunity to try to out for a selection, which I never got to go to the selection, but that's around the same time I was trying to go into our traumatic brain injury clinic. And my doctor at the time was like, Hey, if you go and they find out anything, it could screw you over from going to this unit. I'm like, fuck, I'm not going to go then. Well, I didn't get my chance to go to selection fast forward you know seven years past that uh i'm doing all these like telltale signs are showing up in my life i'm now in charge of an entire special operations company i've been in mars like now for fuck 10 years uh you know i'm super senior in the military i'm an ea in the marine corps uh i'm just really crushing it i'm doing really good and I'm doing this workup and I'm like, I tell my boss, I'm like, yo, dude, I gotta go take a power nap, bro. He's like, well, we got a meeting in 30 minutes. Like, dude, I gotta go sleep. And I was never putting two and two together. Um, even on that deployment, I was constantly taking ranger naps that would happen on this deployment happened like six months later. I'm constantly taking ranger naps, like quick, like 20 second naps here and there, 10 minute naps, uh, sleeping wherever I can. Um, just my performance is really going downhill. And and when I got back home, I just, they're like, tell me how you feel. So this is now I'm like seven, six deployments deep into my military career, seven that one of them didn't count because I wasn't gone like 90 days. Yeah. Um, it's, it's whatever. But, uh, <laughs> okay. Yeah. It's like, oh, you weren't, you were only gone like 65 days. I'm like, okay, thank you. Do you know what we did in those 65 days? It's fine. Yeah. It's fine. It doesn't count. Okay. So you know, and I'm like there. So now I'm like kind of like at the culminating in my career. And I, and I really breezed past a lot of my military shit. But, you know, the main thing was I got to this point where they're like, how you really feel, Cody? I'm like, and I just let it all out. I, and I finally stopped holding back. Uh, I was on the Wounded Warrior um, call list every year. The Wounded Warrior would call me because I was I was a, I had a Purple Heart. So I met their little criteria and i remember one day they called me like hey cody how are you doing just checking in is there anything we can do for you and every year i'd be like oh everything's great thanks a bunch bye this one year they call and i fucking just blew up on them i'm like i'm not fucking good i need fucking help and i never got a phone call back um and i don't fault them for anything i don't this guy who i unloaded onto he was probably like i was probably not expecting this shit you know and he probably didn't know how to handle this protocol. And uh, I don't care either way. I'm not butthurt about that. But I started well, but, to like. Yeah, but I mean, there's a lot with that program that we all understand now. So that's okay. Right. And I start to like really start unloading onto people. Like if you ask me how I'm doing, I'm going to tell you. Uh, cause I realized that I got tired of fucking holding everything back. You know, I wouldn't hold things back about like looking out for dudes, but when it came to myself, I usually always played coy. Uh, I played very small, uh, 
you know, do you drink? Nope, not at all. You know, like, how are you feeling after this appointment? Hunky dory, I'm all good to go. You know, because back in the day, I still thought that I would lose my 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 super high clearance. I would uh, lose this opportunity. I would do all these things, and then I'm like, you know, fuck this, fuck all that, and I'm like, I'm going to tell you exactly how I feel. And then once I started doing that, I was like, wait a second, I'm not losing my clearance. <laughs> Nothing is bad happening to me. And in fact, all the good things are happening to me. I'm actually getting help. And I'm like demanding people help me. Like, I'll tell you what's going on with me if you do this, right? Because I got a lot of lip service before my career and I had a very good career. I was very well known in my organization. So I think when, when I started to like come out and be like, I need help. People were like, oh, that's just Cody. He's loud. You know, he's funny. He's just, just say oh, understood and he'll be okay. I think that was really how I was treated a lot in my career because I was very outspoken about like the institution, training, standards. I was, I would let you know if it, if it fucking sucked, you know? Uh, but when it came to me doing that same level of verbal output about my own well-being, they're like, what's a, this guy's saying he's got, he needs help. You know, these weren't conversations that were going around his special operations unit. Uh, and then I would get feedback like, Cody, we're all, we all go through that. We all have these hard times. I'm like, fuck you, dude. Like, what are you doing about it? And that's when I'm like, that's when I really realized that no one's going to fight for me as much as I'm going to fight for myself. Um, and I went down this road of like, just being like, you know what? Fuck you pay me mindset. Like, you know what? I, it's not like no one owes me anything, but if I'm here and you're asking and no one's firing me yet, I'm going to get the help that I need because I was desperately wanting to live and I was desperately wanting to uh, perform. And what I found out in my career was going from like a hundred mile an hour position, super high stress to a very slow paced transition job uh towards the end of my career i did not know how to handle it so stress i could i could only function under high states of stress i could not function under low states of stress right and that's when i fired for that yeah yeah you know then i was found out like oh yeah you have adhd here's fucking meds for that oh you have sleeping issues here's meds for that and there's all these uppers i was being fed and i mean but i kind of asked for it too there was a side of me that like thought it'd be cool to be on you know, all these different uppers, you know, while, while active duty, there was a side of me that that would be cool to like, be this like super top performer now that I could be super laser focused. And, you know, just like, I don't know, I don't know why I think because you're not given much in the military. So the little you can get, you're like, Oh, this is sick. And the fact that I could get Adderall and still maintain my clearance and do all these things. And like, that wasn't like a known thing back then. Like I thought it was kind of cool but what I didn't really realize that I was just like killing myself super slowly because all I was doing was just stacking like boxes of band-aids on top of these wounds that were really knocking on my door that I was like avoiding, uh, avoiding not because I was scared, but avoiding because I just didn't know what I didn't know. Well, um, that's it. And they count, yeah. the count on that, the count on that, the count on you not knowing any better. It's easier that way. If we just give it to him, he'll take it. We don't give him anything else. A little bit of attention. It's like a kid who's been, or like a dog who bites or snaps at someone. It's because finally when they get attention, they're going to take whatever they can get. And that's, that. actually, that's a really well said and absolutely facts. Uh, I remember I went through like three sleep study a specialist and uh, one of the doctors, I was on basically three different uppers, Dexedrin, Adderall, and Provigil all at the same time at very high doses, like kill a horse type of dose. Um, and I was still passing out. And this doctor wanted to give me Riddle, uh, Riddlin on top of all this other shit. I'm like, bro, I'm a, basically like a professional military athlete and I'm already taking these three things and I'm still fucking crashing. And you want to give me a fourth fucking thing? I'm like, I'm not doing it. He's like, well, you need, you need to. I'm like, no, you know what? Fuck you. And I stopped all that shit because I, I realized that's when I started to learn about like pharmaceutical and how these motherfuckers get paid and mm -hmm. how they didn't care about how I felt. They care about the notes they write because that's how they make their money. Um, and people can say what they want to, but it's just a sheer fact. And so um, I'm like, you know what? Fuck this. And that's when I started like went cold turkey on all these pills because my wife started doing research because she said that she told me and it, it fucking broke me. She's like, when you came back from that deployment, I thought I fucked up. She's like, I thought I married the wrong person. And that devastated me. Um, 
she's like you're just so fucking different and i was like how do i find that how do i i don't even know who i was how do i find that person i didn't know who i was back then but you saw me and now i'm just like in this fight for my life um and that's when i really just started to stand up for myself when i realized that no matter what i said they just wanted to shove more pills down my fucking throat no matter what i said they wanted to categorize me and like hey we all feel this cody and I'm just like looking around. My friends are drinking a case of fucking beer a night, and it's normal. They hate their fuck, dude. I would I would hear stories of like dudes that hate their marriages. Like, oh, I can't wait till my kids are eighteen. I'm gonna get the fucking divorce. Like, these are clearly people that yeah, are they good soldiers? Sure, but do they really know what's best for them when they have these ideas and these conversations? And these are the fucking norm. And I'm not like talking shit. I'm not better than any of these guys by any means. I have my own hell, but. The, the the community wasn't about bettering yourself it no. wasn't about doing what's best for you because it was only about doing what's best for the fucking job and well there ain't no job if your house is broken if your home is broken if your mind's broken if your soul's fucking broken you know there is no fucking job you know that's why all my friends that fucking kill themselves from act while active duty that were these fucking rock stars that people like idolize and worship their home life sucked because they sucked. They were they were in pain, but they put on their yeah. fucking uniform. They had the really nice sleeves. They had the really good to go haircut. They had the very all the accolades. They looked the part, but inside they were empty. And these guys are killing themselves. And they're like, "Whoa, no one saw it coming." Well, no shit, motherfucker, because you're only focused on the the output of dudes, not the input of them. You know. And can you blame the institution for that? No. But there has to be a level of accountability and you can pass that buck off to someone else or you can decide that, you know, that accountability relies on me and falls onto me. Uh, and whether it was selfish or not, that's how I went. And that's the route I took. And once I started to open my mouth to speak up for myself, I didn't stop. And then once I started to get traction and I'm like, I'm getting help, I'm like, okay, I got to use this pain that I'm in now and this because I felt uncomfortable when my friends turned their back on me and shit. They thought it was a fucking pussy. They're like, mm -hmm. why don't you suck it up, Cody? It can't be that bad. I'm like, you think I want to fucking drool on myself, bro? You think I want to pass out on the floor at seven o'clock at nighttime on a Friday night? You think this is just to sh act like I'm like malingering about this? Are you fucking high, bro? You know, um, I'd call my wife crying down my street because I didn't know where I was fucking at. I didn't even know how I got there. And I'd fall off my motorcycles you know i had to sell my bikes i stopped riding because i couldn't even i couldn't even control how my life was crashing and burning i was having uncontrollable adrenaline spikes i had to cancel my free fall um certification because or my 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 uh my pay so i stopped jumping because i would just be like talking to you right now and out of nowhere i'd have this like oh this big adrenaline yeah. spike and on my calm down i would just crash so lethargic well every free fall jump i ever did in my life on the after after i land i already come down with a crash from all that adrenaline dumping right there well my biggest fear was that i was going to have this adrenaline surge on the plane before i even exit and now i'm i'm, I'm jeopardizing somebody and my own life by like not being 100 percent in the game and that was really hard for me to do and a lot of guys i don't think led the way in that capacity where they're having to take that hard look and take a step back and i remember uh my neurosurgeon he asked me and this is around the time where basically all my issues were getting pretty bad and i got to go to the traumatic brain injury clinic called intrepid spirit which is an amazing phenomenal place uh he asked me because i was trying to i was being an idiot and i'm like hey i know i'm fucked up but i had this opportunity to go out this selection that i've been trying to go to for like a yeah. fucking decade <laughs> And he's like, sure, Cody, that that's fine. He's like, but do you think you would be a, a liability over there? And it just punched me right in the face. And I had to give myself an honest, you know, this man asked me a real honest, truthful question that he, I could feel his heart in it. And that set the space up for me to be like, yeah, I'd be totally be a fucking liability. What am I talking about? I hate, I hate all this shit right now. Like, I don't even like dude coming to work. I'm fucked up in here. I don't even like coming to this fucked up place. What makes me think I'm going to go over there? Like it really helped me. Like it was like the catnip was taken away and like reality came back. I'm like, holy shit. Like you can so fall back into the trance of like deception and illusion instantly. And um, so I really 
thank a lot to this fucking doctor because he asked me a very hard question and I'm I'm grateful for the strength to be honest with him because that set me on a course to be where I'm at today. And if I lied to him and lied to myself again, I honestly would just keep on repeating the same self-abuse, self-destructive fucking pattern that I did for 15 years. I think that's the thing too, is the service does a really good job of distraction, 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 because if we don't distract, then we, these people go, holy shit, I don't feel well. I don't, I'm not acting right. My whole family is falling apart. Da, 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 da. So I think there's accountability on the individual, but God damn, there needs to be some more accountability on the service itself too. And I'm just speaking from my experience with Canada. I'm not speaking to yours, but I'm saying there needs to be more accountability on that. But here's the thing. They're not going to take that accountability because if they do take that accountability, the amount of people and money they have wasted on training these individuals, they're going to lose half of their army. They're going to lose it overnight. So distraction tactics work beautifully in getting individuals to go, no, 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 just take the pill, shoot the person, take the pill. You'll be fine. You'll sleep. Headaches are fine. Listen, headaches are normal. Headaches are perfectly normal. Everybody has a headache every day, all day. Did you know that? Everyone has a low grade hum. Found out that's a lie. <laughs> Super big lie. But my point is if they did that, of course they would lose their soldiers. Yes, there has to be self-accountability, but Unfortunately, some individuals, in my opinion, are either so distracted or they're so brainwashed or they really do believe that they're superheroes and that it doesn't matter until all of a sudden they have a gun in their mouth. And, and that's the truth of it is we act like we are all these really tough people until we're not. And then by that point, it's so far gone and we have no support set up for ourselves that it's too late. And that's why you see the epidemic being what it is. So it seems like from get go prior to the military to even when you were starting to, you know, scream about, I need help. <clears throat> you're an anomaly in a good way. And so self-accountability works for you, but it doesn't always work for a lot of these individuals because they, you know, they eat, sleep and breathe that system. And they can't ever think that those people would do anything to harm them. You were able to see through that kind of veil and say, this doesn't feel right. This doesn't feel good. I don't accept this. I don't, and I won't accept this for the rest of my life. That's the difference between you. So when you got to this point though, where you are in a TBI treatment and all of these programs, what is the next step for you? Because I know when you got out of the military to where you are now, there has been massive growth, not only in yourself, but in what you do and the way you live and the philosophy that you carry. Yeah. Um, when I got out, I was, when I, when I found out that I was no longer going to be in the military anymore. And I found out that I was on this medical board and I'm really just waiting my time to hear about my responses. I was, I was like suffering even harder because all that stress dude, my hair was falling out. Uh, I was, I was eating through every mouthpiece they, they gave me from the doctors. Cause I was just always clenching. That's how I have my gold tooth. Um, I was a hot mess and I'm in Tampa doing brain treatment, uh, this experimental brain treatment, um, because I'm trying to set myself up for success as best as I can before I get out, because I know my odds are much higher because I'm active duty and I have top priority vice being a civilian. Uh, even though there's a lot of nonprofits out there, I have like state of the art. I don't have to wait. I don't have to worry about funding. I'm an active duty. I'm a shoe in And so I was... I was very fortunate that my command at the time allowed me to go to go do me. I'm just really grateful. Uh, my last probably eight, nine months in the Marine Corps was a fucking absolute blessing. I basically was able to like walk away from all my military stuff. I got to actually intern with a civilian company called Soft Lead. Um, I got to basically play civilian for nine months as I was doing all these medical treatments, uh, waiting my approval or denial of my medical board. So I catch one of my medical board that, hey, I'm going to be getting out in like 30 days. I'm like shitting bricks. I'm like, fuck, I'm in debt. I don't know what I'm going to do with my life. I don't even know who the fuck I am. I'm still drilling on myself. I can barely use a GPS on my fucking phone. What do I do now? And so my wife uh, asked me this question. She's like, hey, if you got like four weeks left to live, like, what do you want to do? And I'm just like, ah. <laughs> uh, Sorry. That's a, that's a tough question. I didn't know anything. And so I literally... I, I said the first thing that like popped into my head and I said like travel around, take pictures. And that's when like we caught one of like van life, uh, like van and campers and shit like that. So 
long story short, we started to like downsize our life completely. Uh, we sold everything that we possibly could that was liquid to afford a van and to set ourselves for success with no debt. Uh, sold sold our big ass house, moved into a, a a buddy's room, paid him rent. Like just really like went from like super comfort to like I'm living out of a fucking bag now. This is a new experience for me. I don't even know what I'm doing. It was very uncomfortable. I was very cozy. You know, I I, I loved a very cozy life. I had a beautiful house, nice things. I spent all my money on things, possessions, because I was coping the hell inside here with the nice shit outside here. Um, and it showed. And now that all these things are going away, because uh, that version of me is going away, and I don't even fucking know what version of me is coming up. I don't even know who the fuck I am. Um, we get into our van, and I literally hated every aspect of it. I, it was really cool telling people like, hey, you're going to move into a van. And people are like, damn, dude, you're crazy. You're going to do that? And you're like, yeah, I'm going to fucking do it. Fuck it, man. I'm invested in myself. Fuck it. They're like, dude, you're weird. I'm like, I know. <laughs> and then my wife and I actually leave and we take off in the van. I'm like, this fucking sucks. My anxiety didn't go away. My depression didn't go away. My unknown didn't go away. I was fucking staying at Walmart parking lots, super stressed out, always in the red. Um, and I needed it. I knew that if I did not completely separate myself from my absolute comfort of my norm, I was never going to fucking stand a chance of what I needed to do. And I needed to go on this Mecca. I needed to fucking suffer. I didn't know it at the time, but there was that voice inside me that said, dude, how bad you want to fucking live? You know, how bad do you want this? Because I, I, I truly believe that my whole life is a play uh i'm here to serve a purpose you know like you said earlier there's a lot of people that don't see things a certain way they don't know that they are brainwashed or programmed they don't know that they're going too far down the fucking hole point and overturn and i see it differently and i'm fucking blessed with a voice and i'm blessed with experience to back that voice and wisdom through the pain to to share this experience with people and i'd be damned if like i said earlier if i'm going to go through all of that and just throw it away because i feel sorry for myself um and so we did we lived in the van for about three years three and a half years traveled around even made our way up to canada a eh? um <laughs> too bad we didn't know each other then man I you know, right? have a space to... now you do now you got a spot yeah i was up in quebec i actually went up there to get some like uh yeah i did not like quebec by the okay. way I I know. Was... okay 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 <laughs> okay stop i was posted to quebec as oh, the shit. only english-speaking gunner that makes sense. A lot so, of sense. Yeah. Welcome. Yeah. I did not like it. Nobody uh, does. I did not like it. And that was a big, that was hard for me. That was really hard. It was very uncomfortable for me. Um, just to just, I was out of my comfort zone. All of it was. But I needed it more because I, res I resented life. I resented nature. I resented freedom. I resented the military. I resented myself. I resented everything in my life. And being in this fucking spaceship, this, this, this time traveling vessel to go be uncomfortable in all these places, transform my absolute life to the point where I was so stoked. I was going to go meet a friend that I met online in uh, New York. That sounds and, like a kidnapping waiting to happen. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it was kind of like that. But there was no bad type of lies, thank God. Okay, thank God. And so I'm driving my big ass van in New York and I'm just so stoked that I'm not panicking. I'm so stoked that I'm not being... The only thing I was overwhelmed about New York was that my van, I had it lifted. And so ah. the bridges are fucking short and they have like that like they have like the sizes of like how high it is. I'm like, is there, it is <laughs> for the lowest portion of the van of the, of the bridge, not the highest portion. I'm like, dude, we're going to, our solar panels are going to get fucking gone. I'm like, I have like my buttholes like super tight. So that was the only thing of, of New York that stressed me out. But I got on a subway, I walked around the city and I was fucking chill. I was smiling. I was happy. Um, and along this whole way of like, kind of like pain and discomfort, I like dove extremely heavy into uh psychedelics uh psychedelics and reading two things i never really did in my life uh two things that i habitually do in my life uh now of 
because what they do for me and what they allow me to kind of see and experience. And my biggest issue that I had with psychedelics when I first dove into them was that I wasn't putting in the work. Mm -hmm. I, uh, you know, I'm self-educated. I didn't go to a course. I didn't watch a YouTube video. I fucked around and I found out myself, uh, which is how I learn best. I have to touch the fire to know it's hot. And I found out that psychedelics can be really hot. Um, <laughs> but I wasn't, I wasn't putting in the, the, I didn't, I was still learning about all my self-investment shit. I, I figured it out all my own from reading books, watching things, doing research. Cause I didn't know how to do any of that stuff. And that's what I was lacking when I started all this off. I wasn't, I, w- I would take, I would do psilocybin and have this big relief of like, oh my God, my life has changed and transformed. I have all this obtained wisdom and I see my fucking pain as, as pressure, as a uh, purpose and all these things. But I wasn't doing the daily deposits of, you know, exercising, nutrition, detoxing my life, breathing and working on, okay, why am I being triggered? Why are my emotions nuts? And why am I this? Why am I that? I was just like riding the wave and I would hit these crash and burns, crash and burns, crash and burns until I realized that, okay, bro, when are you going to keep on doing this? My wife said this like great wisdom to me. And I, I share it with everyone I meet. If whatever you're doing isn't working, do something different. And it's so simple yet profound because I was doing these things and doing really great. And then I would crash and she's like, well, bitch, whatever you're doing isn't working. I'm like, okay, I got to do something different. You know, so <laughs> this I woman, th- this woman sounds like she's been with you for uh, a minute. And it sounds like she is a, uh, she's a special one. She's yeah, an my anchor. Wife, yeah. My wife, Stephanie, uh, she is a blessing in my life. She, when I was sitting on my buddy's couch, just the lowest of my fucking low, you know, she's, we, we ate normal food at the grocery store. We took fucking basic supplements. You know, we, we did things we did materialistic things we did catchy things that you see and do right because that's what you do we did we did that shit and then when she saw that these pills that were taken were killing me she spent like hundreds of hours of research she realized that like oh look at the fucking chemicals in there look at these things and you already have a chemical imbalance oh look at the normal meat that you buy from a normal grocery store it contains all this bullshit and then you know, you, you, that animal has fucked up energy, low energy, low vibration. You eat that shit. You obtain low vibration, low energy. You are what you consume. You watch fucking, you watch fear porn on TV. You live a very fear porn life. You know, that's, it's how it works. And we started to get into this whole like metaphysical space, the spiritual space, this, this energy space, this, this new way of living. And it fucking changed everything for us. And it was hard. Uh, it was super hard. I mean, to to detox your the life that you want for your old life is not easy um because people think you're fucking crazy um they're like oh you're you're detoxing from heavy metals cody that's fucking some witchcraft booty booty bullshit i'm like <laughs> think about all the times you put a dip in while cleaning your gun with clp with no gloves on think about all the time you threw shit to the trash that was burning and you just stood there smoking a cigarette think about all the fucking times that you huff and puff fumes think about all the shitty food that you eat that literally says for government and military use only think about all the <laughs> think about all the dumb shit that you've had put into your body you've exposed to your body the water quality right we're a big ass organ our skin is mm-hmm. the largest organism in our body right and so when anything it absorbs us it takes like 25 seconds to absorb into your skin or like a 45 seconds to absorb what do you think is going to happen over time and i never ever thought about this shit before i was i thought it was organic foods for fucking yuppies purified waters for fucking douchebags i never <laughs> saw the purpose until i started to like detox everything i detox from heavy metals i changed the quality of water that i drank i actually went vegan for probably eight nine months because i needed to i was eating like just basic store-bought fucking meat. And I was constantly inflamed. I constantly had uh, uh, inflammation and I was so puffy and super lethargic, brain fog all the time. And so I had to detox all that shit, let my system reset. I had nasty acid reflux from all the stress in my life and all the shit food I was eating. Uh, I had to basically like fight to detox from like my porn addiction. I had to fight to detox from all my fucking pill addiction. I had to, had to like do all these different things that were completely uncomfortable for me to do because I had to own them. 
uh, had to take that extreme ownership of them all. And that was not fun to do. And doing all those things set us up for success. And then the psychedelic aspect really helped me understand why I had gone through all these things and why that I'm here and like what my voice is and what my true purpose is. And I didn't see it my first time. I didn't see it my second time. I had never fucking no, no path has ever been illuminated for me. I realized uh, that the scary shit is the way the unknown is the way the dark side is the fucking way, not the dark side, like evil, but the dark path, the unlit path is the fucking way you must walk down. To, if you want to stand a chance to find yourself and, um, you know, because what we're seeking is right in front of us and we suffer from not being present. We suffer from the fucking illusion that we're doing our best. We're trying everything, but we're actually not. We have lied to ourselves for so fucking long. We have programmed our own self. We are so fucking smart and so powerful that not only are billions of dollars spent annually to program your mind to con obey, comply, consume, but you're so powerful, you can program your own fucking mind by talking shit to yourself silently in your head with your silent thoughts, and you begin to believe it. And then when you tell people like, yo, you ever heard the study where you talk shit to these plants and you, and you fucking play classical Bach to this plant? These are going to fucking flourish. Why these are going to suffer and die. But people don't want to put two and two together because that means they have to fucking see. And when you see, when you see what you're doing is not right for you anymore, that is not, that is a reflection that people don't want. I know motherfuckers that get dressed, look at themselves in the mirror, but they're looking at their outfit. They're not even looking at their own reflection, their own eyes, that fucking light that is unlit in them. That's like, spark me up, motherfucker. Let's do this because that would take them to pause and reflect on what they're actually doing and seeing. And I hurled myself into the flames, uh, throughout my entire evolution, um, ever since getting out of the military, because I realized that that was the only way I was going to stand a chance. And, you know, I'm strong. I really am. Uh, I, I'm brave for myself. You know, I really am. But I have this clarity because of my wife. I, I have this opportunity because of my wife, because when I was incapable of fucking being the man that she married, she fucking did the research to, to help fucking guide me and support me, uh, to help me stand a chance to find a flicker of who I was when we met. Um, and I still don't think I'm that same guy. I like to think that I'm better, but I'm also just different too. And because I realized that I can't just, I'm not cured. I'm not, I'm not healed. Right. You know, I, I, I always have to work on myself every day. I have to do something for myself. I, I'm never, I'm not above anything. And I realized that I'm not above growth. And just because I detox myself doesn't, I got to detox 24 seven. The fuck you think those are real clouds you're looking at? Where do you think those things are coming down on? You think the water in your in your city just magically got fucking better because an article came out? No, everything is out to get you. And not in a scary way, but we're so fucking important. We have such a higher calling in life. And people feel so, there's a reason why people feel so victim. There's a reason why people feel so fucking sad and empty. And it's all by grand design because if you once took that fucking power to reflect inward and be like, my, I have no money. My relationship's fucking broken. I'm absolutely scared. I don't know who the fuck I am. I feel inadequate. If you really look at those and be like, well, who the fuck can change these things? And if you saw a reflection in your own fucking hand, you'd be like, God damn, that person's me. Because people do it every day. But when you tell them, that, oh, that person's different. That person has it different. That person caught a break. Bitch, there is no break when it comes to freeing yourself. It's only hard work. And to free yourself doesn't mean that it's over. To free yourself means you've just committed to the fucking path of walking into the affray. And guess what? The fray does not like you. It is not there to coddle you. It's not there to fucking protect you. It's just there for you to fucking navigate. And the more you walk into that fucking place, the more you realize, A, you know nothing. B, you're all fucked. And, and, and C, it doesn't get any easier. But it's sure as a hell a lot. I'd rather go to fucking war every fucking day into the unknown than think that I made it, think that I'm healed, think that I'm cured, think that I'm saved, and think that I can just sit on my fucking ass and do nothing to invest in myself and hope that my living situation gets better, hope that my mental state gets better, hope that my message gets stronger and louder by doing fucking nothing. 
that's that's an illusion and there's a lot of people especially americans that live in this fucking black box that have lied to themselves about truly about change they look for power external to themselves they fucking think that Timmy down the street's going to save them. They're waiting for that fucking next social media post to fucking spark their day. No, bitch. You have to spark it yourself. You have to stop consuming and start fucking actioning things. And it took me a lot of years to realize that because I was just a consumer. I was always taking from people. I just wanted I wanted your attention. I wanted dopamine. I wanted to feel fucking appreciated. And I don't give a fuck who I had to get it from. Because I was that fucking empty inside. I was a fucking cavity that you're packing a wound in. But instead of using gauze, you're using air. So I was never, ever stopping the fucking bleed. I was just fucking filling myself full of hopes and dreams. And when, you know, after a lot, really after my, my, my ayahuasca and DMT experience in Peru, I saw that I, I saw that everyone in my life was a part of my life and had got me to the point where I'm at today. And I can continue to not see that or I could actually do something about it. And I found out that I could actually change my life if I wanted to, that nobody was, no medicine was ever gonna change me. It showed me that you've heard this yourself, that you are the medicine. It showed me that I am the fucking chance. And I truly believe that in this life, our whole purpose in life is to remember. It's not to it's not to heal. It's not to grow. It's not to make hella money. No, you're gonna do that by remembering your power. All these great things in your life will fucking come from you remembering because we're so fucking smart that we are constantly targeted to forget our own strength and our own power. You know, you hear these stories of moms lifting cars off of fucking their kids. We would call it adrenaline, bitch. I've had adrenaline. I was never lifting a fucking car off anybody. You know, we we are not what we are made out to be. We're not what we're made out to be. So if we can take that into consideration and we can stop thinking that psychedelics and plant medicine is taboo and, but we can believe all these other dumb shit that's out there, all these other very mainstream things that they want you to buy into it and believe. And you're like, oh yeah, that makes sense. I'll just give my power away and put it all in this thing and, and call it good. Well, when are you going to snap out of this delusion that you're in and take ownership of your life and be like, you know what, guess what? Guess what? If there's a higher power, there's not a higher power. There's this or that. It doesn't matter, right? What is real is right now. And if I don't like my life, if I don't like my fucking situation, the only person that can change that is me. Uh, and I'm just so grateful that I had a, a, a strong woman in my life that didn't allow my words to break her, didn't allow my actions to fucking break her. And that she fucking saw me for what I truly am. And that's that potential of, of evolution. Um, and in doing so, you know, that's given my wife permission to work on herself and heal a lot of her fucking childhood trauma and and invest in herself. And I'm just like, life is a trip because we're doing it together. You know, you're in this badass avatar like I am with me, but I know a soul exists. I know a soul's real. I've seen a soul. I've seen a dead body. They, they look soulless as fuck. They have no energy, life source in them. So mm -hmm. that can be real then what is truth? What, what is possible? If I can see that, if I can see a fucking dead body and they look soulless, they look dead as fuck, like no life form, just a bag of bones and skin. But then I look at a living person, I see this abundant opportunity to, to do anything. Well, I can either wipe my eyes and get to work or I can still act like, what happened, bro? What'd you say? I can do nothing different with my life and still live in this la-la land delusional world where I believe tomorrow's going to come. I believe that the fucking shit that I'm putting into my body is just super healthy because some fucking famous Instagram person told me it's good for me, you know? Advice me doing a lick of research. Oh, you hate this person? I hate them too. I got your back, bro. You're not the type of homie I want, motherfucker, if you don't have your own two cents. You know, um, and all this happened because a lost, very sad, scared version of me in 2018 said, enough is enough. You know, all this happened today because I said, enough is a fucking, enough. I'm done lying to myself. And, you know, it wasn't easy and I'm not over anything. I'm not done with anything. It doesn't stop. Um, but you have to start somewhere. It's like a business. Was your business thriving when you first created it? No, you... hell no. No, right. I mean, 
I mean, listen, it's I had a cup. I had a couple real like quick catches, like some people saw it and then we did the Ellen thing and we did the huh, but then you know what else also happened? We were doing this, right? Tick, 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 COVID happened. Tick, 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 Jocko happened. Tick, 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 real shit happened. Tick, 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 stuff happens, life happens. You choose though, if you want to live down there, you want to accept that vibration. You want to accept what the world says, <clears throat> this is what it's going to be now. And instead you can sit there and do exactly what you said. You can either wipe your fucking chin, get up and fix the problem. Or you can just say, you know what? I'm going to be like everyone else and I'm just going to accept and I'm going to roll over and I'm going to say, well, I guess it's over for me. Everything I worked for is over for me. Or I could say, fuck that. Fuck you. You don't get to dictate this. You don't get to dictate what I do. You don't get to dictate if I'm successful. You don't get to dictate anything I do. I hold the power for myself and those around me and anybody else who has anything to say about it can sit and spin because this is my life. And I survived that so that I could go through that so that I could grow to here. And you don't get to take that from me. No one does at any point at for any reason. But the problem is, is we have too many individuals who decide when they've been knocked down, whether it's they've never dealt with adversity or issues or struggle in their life, they go, okay, that I'm meant to be down here. I'm meant to feel like this. This is just supposed to be my life. Only good things happen to big people. Only book deals happen to successful people. Only film deals, only this, only that. Fuck those people. They put their pants on the same way I do. Probably not because I'm shorter than them, but they do. And guess what? We are all the fucking same. And when we all realize our own our own power and our own potential, that is when big things happen. But it's because people decide to tell us that we're not good enough, that for some reason we accept that. There is a very a minority of people who sit there when someone says no, you laugh in their face, you kick the fucking door down and you say, yes, motherfucker, I'm here, I'm staying. And there's not a goddamn thing you can do to stop this momentum. You've tried, you've lost. I don't care how big you are on social media. I don't care how big you are in our community. I don't care. Do you know why? Because I'm terrifying and I will win no matter what you say. The problem is we don't teach our kids this. We don't teach the next generation this. We let them believe that these things are the only things that matter when that's just not the truth. You can have a million or two or 20 or a hundred thousand, a hundred million followers, but guess what? When that just turns off, who are you now? And most of those people can't answer that question. <sighs> I love meeting new people that I want to keep in my life. Homie, I'm here to stay. Welcome to the club, son. You know, I, you know, as you know, like being on the, on that, uh, the show I was just on the Sean Ryan show, mm -hmm. it brought in a lot of eyes, a lot of visibility on my on my brand, we defy the norm on my personal page, my, my, my personal branding. And, you know, I was saying it to myself the other day, you know, I remember I had like, I remember having like no followers on social media and now I have, you know, quite a bit different number, mm -hmm. but the message is still the same. Mm -hmm. And I, and then I'm just like, like, when I look at my shit now, I'm like, I'm fucking stoked because you should be, that doesn't define me. But what it does, it gives me a bigger fucking stage. Dude, I can never have the stage that I have if it wasn't for this fucking phone or this opportunity to, to connect with so many lives out there that are desperately needing to hear not what I have to say. They need to just hear the fucking proper frequency fucking combined to match the tone they desperately need to be like, that's it. Aha, mm -hmm. that's it. You know, but the thing is they're too muddled. There's a lot of noise out there. There's a lot of people mm -hmm. that blow the fuck up and they forget who they are. Like you said, they lose control. And, and I've, I've learned this level. I've learned this in my own life. Cause I've been trying to, I've heard this term leveling up. You've heard this. Oh yes. And I'm like, what the fuck does that mean? And I'm watching these, these mentors of mine or these gazillionaires, people that I, I emulate or like, I admire what they're doing. Right. But they're like, they like they're driving the cars, they're flying the jets, they're doing these things. They're, they're talking about leveling. What the fuck does leveling up mean? And to me, I had this profound experience uh, a couple of weeks ago. I'm like, to me, leveling up is handling the fucking like trajectory and the velocity that you're going. 
You know, mm -hmm. it's not, can you not crash and burn? That's what leveling up is. Can you be the who you are fucking today when no one's watching you, when the whole fucking world is watching you? That's to me is leveling up. Can you be mm -hmm. a good motherfucker and still pick up trash when you have no fucking money in your pocket until you have fucking cash? You're just donating left and right because it's fucking abundant in your life. Can you still be that same motherfucker? Can you open a door for a motherfucker? Can you look in the eyes of a motherfucker? Can you still be that same person when no one fucking knew who your name was to when you're when you fucking made it? That to me is leveling up. And uh, that might not be to everyone's turn, but I'm just like, I'm gonna fucking level the fuck up. Yeah, you are. I, I ain't fucking stopping, dude. And that's right. Why would I? Why that's would it. anyone stop? And and my and now that I have all these new eyes on me, I get a lot of these, I get a lot of messages, a lot of a lot of sad people, a lot of victims. And it's I honestly am so stoked to be like, bro you need to change your fucking outlook. You, know, you need to join my fucking coaching group. You need to go, you need to go fucking find help. You need to go do something. I'm just so stoked that I don't, you know, back in the day when I first was trying to heal myself, I was sympathizing and like, Oh, it's okay. You should blah. I was like pandering to the fucking masses. I'm like, you know what? Fuck you, dude. You think I'm here because I'm better than you? No motherfucker. I'm better than me. And until you see that it's not you against anyone else. It's you against you. You're never going to level the fuck up. And now I can tell that to people with so much confidence and I don't give a fuck if it hurts their feelings. They need their feelings hurt because they've just been coddling and sympathizing with their own fucking demons for years now. But they haven't done shit. I had this person to, uh, the other day tell me that they had no money and they're fucking, how is my life fucking good? I got no fucking money. I got no fucking job. I can't keep any of this, blah, 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 blah. I'm just thinking to myself like, dude, what the fuck happened to you? Because you had to be someone to have no fucking money and to complain about not having fucking money. You had to be someone to get to where you're at today, fucking broken and battered. You had to do something, and it was a veteran. Mm. You had to have the courageous fucking lady nuts to sign up and put mm -hmm. yourself out there. So what happened to you? How did you forget? And that just solidifies what life is to me. It is about remembering motherfucker you might be going through something hard now bitch but like what happened 10 years ago when you're just fucking on top of the world you're that same person you're not mm -hmm. broken you just fucking forgot oh you have the money motherfucker there's 12 year olds out here that are hustling oh bitch, yes. go work at mcdonald's like go find something go turn your fucking pain into a purpose and do something about it stop stop fucking hiding behind being a goddamn victim and how the world is against you fuck you you know what because right. i had that same outlook and I'm telling you from firsthand experience, when you do that shit, you end up nowhere. You lose friends not because you're leveling up and growing. You lose friends because you're fucking an anchor in their life. And That's they might right. not be fucking growing, but guess what? They don't got time for your bullshit, Chip. And That's, right. that's like the main thing. So, you know, it's like this – to have this like level of tough love and confidence in my own voice and in my own skin now, I'm just like – because I have – work my ass off to even be able to just truly not fucking care anymore and i care about a lot of things and so when i say don't care it is not like i'm better than you fuck you but to not care about like hurting people's feelings or triggering because i needed to be triggered i needed to be hurt when i was fucking trying to escape hell i needed that shit and i didn't know mm -hmm. it at the time and when it happened to me it was profound and i hated it but guess what that's all I needed to fucking spark that little bitty flame in me to be like, you know what? Okay. It took me six years to pick up one rank in the military. Well, and I had to wait for six years to even get that chance to pick up that rank. Well, maybe it's going to take me six years to get to the next level of life and the next phase of life. And so I need to commit to what I'm doing now, be really good at the position I'm in now. And so when I do get a chance to fucking level up, or I do get a chance to get that next promotion in life or in the military. I could be my fucking best and not be the same motherfucker I was six years ago. Cause then you're just fucking an anchor in life and you're not going anywhere. That's exactly right. My God. I hate so much that I have to cut this interview. I hate that we have to stop here. God damn it, Cody. We need a part two. We need a part two. We're doing a part two. We're going to schedule it right after this. I am. I am honored. I am energized. You are my type of people. You are the reason why I do this show. 
you are the reason right here why I do this show because people need to hear that. They need the tough love. They need to understand that you can go through living hell, but it doesn't have to be the end of you. It can be the beginning of you. It can be the fuel for you, but it can be the reason. That is why you are here. This is why you are going to be successful in anything that you do in your life, anything, because you have that fire that burns within you. You don't need to be motivated, motivated by anybody else, but yourself. You do that to yourself. That's called self-accountability. That is growth. And that is the definition of what everyone should be striving for. Ugh. Where does everyone find your social medias? God, I hate that I have to cut this. Where does everyone find your social medias? We defy the um, we defy the norm. We didn't even get a chance to talk about your amazing clothing company, but we will blast about it all over the place. I'll grab some stuff. I'll start promoting the hell out of it because it is amazing. It stands for growth. It stands for just overcoming. It is the definition of, like I said, what everyone should be. Where do we find it? How do we support you? Uh, you can support the brand or you can just go check it out. I have a bunch of blogs in there too. If you're just looking for that one piece of information, weedifythenorm.com. Uh, you can find me on Instagram at the Cody Alford, just spelled out just like that. Um, yeah, I fucking, I'm so grateful. This life is insane and I'm just truly grateful for this opportunity to get to talk to you, hear your vibe, hear your voice, and to hear what your mission is and what you're doing and what you stand for and what you represent. And my hat is off to you. It's, it is not an easy path that you're on, um, but that's what separates you from your old you. Yeah. That old me, it was just a, I was 18 and a baby. I had no idea, son. That's okay. Sometimes okay. you don't, you don't need to know. Sometimes you just got to, got to enjoy the journey, enjoy the ride and learn along as you go. And then sometimes you get to connect with people like this. So it's an honor to have you, my friend. There will be a part two. Everybody else, we'll see you all next week.